Welcome back to What's New With Mead. We're in episode 41 of the podcast, and I have Nathan Stegman here to uh, chat about mead making. Um, uh, emphasis on his last name because I I'm trying to make sure and get it right. So uh, Nathan, welcome to the podcast. Hey Garrett, I'm happy to see you. Happy to be here. <laughs> so I um we have met in the past, and I, I it was I frankly I don't remember a conversation we had or anything because it's been a long time. My brain is a lot of ha- happened since 2018, but we first interacted back in uh, when I was in St. Paul, Minneapolis area um for the iron bee in 2018 and i had the opportunity to meet a bunch of people and so um and your name was said i believe it was said at least a couple times during that iron bee i I don't recall what you won but i feel like your name was said at least a few times um i could be wrong i remember your uh your peppermint mead there that was (laughs) one of the things that we were we're passing around quite a bit and uh yeah it was an interesting time (laughs) <laughs> it was yes yes and uh they, that, that recipe is i think it's getting more fleshed out over time which is kind of fun but um so yeah we met back then and uh i've heard your name ever since then you you know you've kind of popped up on both the mead house podcast but also in the the competition sphere i've said i've seen your name multiple times in places and so you are um a competitive uh, competitive you are a, a a very well-versed home mead maker who enters into competitions. I wouldn't say competitive. I feel like that's a different world. Well, I, I, I try to do my best, I guess. <laughs> uh. Competitive has a, has a tone that like you are like, you're only making mead for competitions. And I, I don't know that that's true of you. No, uh, I think first and foremost, always been making mead uh, something that I I want to drink, make the mead you want to drink. Um, yeah, I think that the competition side of things uh, is one of those things where you, you're getting some feedback and, and learning how to be better at mm-hmm. your hobby. So I think that, you know, you take it with a, a bag of salt, uh, so to speak. <laughs> not a grain, but a bag, you know. And, uh, you know, I like like to share meads, um, obviously, with the meads that I'm making and I'm, I'm sharing with my neighbors, my friends, um, uh, it's it's a wonderful uh, obsessive compulsive hobby, as I've learned. Uh, lots of folks who uh, are are actively engaged in trying to uh, get as much of different kinds of honeys and exploration with that. Um, and you know, uh, yeah, I did go down the rabbit hole with that. And so uh, the competitions were also an answer for <laughs> how else can I share this mead with others yeah. and, and also get feedback in various parts of the country too. So um, I think that's one of the, the greatest things about some of these competitions. And you know, if you if you don't win, it's not really all about winning. Um, certainly, mm-hmm. that's the guys with another you know, groups of folks that, that are very competitive, as you say, um, we all like to, to have some acknowledgements of the, of the things that we create, uh, but mm-hmm. certainly uh, looking to see what's out there and see, you know, hey, wow, I might want to try to make something like that myself and, you know, see how it works. Um, repetition being another thing, uh, trying to see, you know, how, how I've done in, in the past with certain honey varieties and uh, maybe try to replicate, even though, we know it's not always going to be an exact replication of the thing you made just the other month. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, learning, learning very much. So on that end. So, yeah. Yeah. Fun I, uh, that I'm, I'm glad you said that because I think people often enter competitions and, um, they're very bummed when they maybe don't score as well as they thought, or, um, I, I think, I have a friend who who's studying to be a sommelier and he talks about, I think it's cellar tongue is what it is where you are only really ever drinking your meads. And so you kind of sometimes have this uh, perspective that your mead, like it's good, no doubt, but you don't have, you don't understand what's out there. And so you send your stuff out and it's your, your child that you've spent 12 months on, you know, trying to just perfect. And then it comes back and, the, the judges might not like it as much as you want. And I think it's important for people to know that that's personal opinion on the judges, of course. Um, so your mead, just like you make mead for yourself, should be intended kind of for yourself. But two, that feedback you receive is so valuable. I mean, those hopefully those judges are well-versed in making mead and also judging mead. 
So they're giving feedback on, on what they see. And I think because they don't know you, they don't, uh, I don't want to say they don't care about you, but they don't know you personally. <laughs> they don't see your face. They don't know your name. They're given unbiased feedback that is super valuable. So entering Absolutely. any competition is so important for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. myself included i need to i actually need to submit more this 2022 is my year to try and just start putting stuff out there for sure yeah well it's it's an amazing thing um you know it, it's it's always encouraging to to try to put yourself out there um and i think even for that matter just you know looking at different areas where you know it's not just everyone around you you know may have family and friends that say yeah this is great you know i like mm -hmm. this this is really great i like the you make a really good sweet meat or whatnot, you know, we're, we're in the sugar belt here. Uh, but you know, Hey, uh, we do a little bit more than just sweet meats. We do dry meats. We do Tej, we do Polish meats. We do a lot of different varieties, braggots in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's, there's over 13 categories on, on mead alone. And even within those subsets, you've got so much to play around with. Um, yeah. so I think it's just a, a principal, uh, goal to kind of put yourself outside your comfort zone and, put your meads, uh, put your babies in the mail and uh, <laughs> see, what, yeah. see what happens. Um, better for worse. And if I, if I win a competition, great. Um, you know, if, if, if I've discouraged someone by not winning in that competition, I'm sorry. Um, but you know, unfortunately, uh, we're all trying to, to get better in this craft. Yeah. I'm absolutely marveled and amazed and encouraged by the level of mead making that's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and the number of people that are exploring this hobby, uh, it's just amazing. And I've only really been doing this, I guess, since uh, on about 2017, about five, five, almost five years now, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's, you know, it's growing by leaps and bounds, of course. So I, yeah. I, we've been doing it about the same time. I don't know when you started. Mine was about August 2017. And so I don't know. You probably started a little bit before me. But um, it has grown so much. I've seen it in the YouTube realm, especially there, the presence of people making content for one is big, but also you just see more people in general, like the, the uh, people talking about mead seems to be growing. I hear about it in more commercial avenues than I did a couple of years ago, which is very encouraging. And I, I think that bodes well for us as we are not only intending to um, make more mead, but it'll hopefully make, people uh, more comfortable with drinking it. Like you said, you, you give it to friends and stuff. Um, I think most people will take free booze regardless. It's kind of like a, uh, I don't know. When people stop taking your free booze, I think that's where the trouble begins. If they, if you try to give stuff to them, they're like, no, I'm good. That's when you should step back and go, hmm, maybe am I doing something weird? It's, yeah, I think that it comes from the level of, you know, some some nuances of where home brewing started. You know, my, I get ribbed from my uh, my brother a while back when I first introduced him to saying, you know, this is, hey, this is a mead I made. And I made uh -huh. I'm also entered it into a contest, you know. Um, he always used to say, hey, you making that bathtub beer again, you know. And, yeah, I, it's it's very it's a very different kind of nuance uh, when you're approaching that with some folks that they have no idea. They they again the whole meat you know meat or mead you know it's no mm -hmm. it's it's mead it's a <laughs> it's actually a beverage uh, you know so yeah it's it's a fun thing I guess I I was really happy to to have some folks around me to give me a little bit of a tip and send me on my way and, mm -hmm. you know, catch, catch the fever of, of that, uh, in mechanism and education, I guess uh -huh. I do have to always give props to my uh, mentor, Matt Whitey, um, was basically five now, I guess, what is it? Probably five years ago, we had a, an iron brewer contest in our own club before we had mm -hmm. the iron B we were trying to do some different things in one of those, um, uh, internal contests uh, for fun was, you know, trying to come up with a, a brew with uh, that used honey. And, um, you know, we, we all attempted that. I made like a rye beer with some honey. Um, didn't fare too fairly well. But after that, we had a nice education about making mead and mm -hmm. uh, showed us a little bit about how he uh, used bananas and some other things with peanut butter to make a really wonderful odd combination with like mm -hmm. some boucher um, you know, mead. And it was just, it was just one of those things where it's like, well, what do you, what do you need to make it? Okay. So we got down to the basics of these things and then just, you know, um, 
I guess that there's the hurry up and wait aspect of need. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And so with that, I said, man, uh, yeah, I'll give this a shot. Um, I didn't, uh, I guess the, the thing just to maybe just briefly about, you know, when you think about need, I, um, I didn't start in the, maybe the traditional factor, what some people do. They, they may start with a traditional mead and they take honey and then they just use yeast and water and, and so on and so forth. I, I made four meads. Uh, when I first started, four of them at the same time. Um, I made a blackberry pineapple with clover honey. I made uh, a banana and strawberry mead with amateur spice. Uh, I went down further down the rabbit hole. I made a uh, dragon fruit mead uh, with El Dorado hop hash. Uh, in wow. <laughs> there to try to figure out something else that I was going with, with some snowberry honey. And then I just did a traditional, but I did a traditional with a honey variety that I came to love, um, fireweed honey. And uh, uh, that just made me kind of, you know, go off from there, um, trying all these different combinations out. And the first year after that, um, I was – Entering into the national contests, uh, not to talk about too much on competitions, but I mean, I won like a third place in the national. And I was like, wow, I was just so amazed that that could happen. Uh, I got first place in best to show the Dom Ross Cup. And that's the first time I ever entered that contest. I was like, wow, I'm kind of on a roll. Uh, I did kind of go down the OCD rabbit hole even further. And I was making like, yeah. 30 some odd needs at the same time. Uh, and then <laughs> continue on from there. I think, you know, that's just the thing when you, when you get the fever for it, um, you just start. Oh yeah. It, I've never met a mead maker who's made one. I've never met someone who said, I only made one mead and then I'm out. It's like, I made one. mead, And then even if it goes bad, like it could be terrible. I think most people are like, I have to try that again. Like there's just something about mead making that is, just so fascinating for people. And yeah. that, that's what's so fun about it. It's an amazing thing. Um, and, and it's nuanced to, to what you, what you think. I think a lot of culinary experience, um, you know, you can make a beer and can spend a, a great deal of time trying to perfect the, the boil, the temperatures, everything like this. And, and then you, you go ahead and you're, you're setting it aside and you're waiting for that to happen. And meat is this, this process where you're, you know, you're engaged in it. You're not really necessarily like setting or forgetting it, but um, the, the setup time is, is less. So it's, yeah. it's one of those things that's, uh, that can give you the opportunity to produce a lot of different types and varieties. So that's, that's yeah. encouraging for most people. Um, I had the unfortunate circumstance that I was making five gallon batches at a time. So you can imagine what my basement looked like uh, starting out. And uh, yeah, we had to eventually just uh, kind of, I think nowadays just trying to tone back to what I want in the way of uh, what, you know, buy less, buy better um, Mm -hmm. and try to perfect things into into smaller batches too. So I'm not worried about uh, getting rid of all of this uh, more than I can drink myself. So so yeah. That's a lot of mead to get rid of. Five gallons. I mean, I, I mean, I do a lot of one gallons. I do. I'm starting to scale up for things with, of recipes that I know my friends like. But even mm-hmm. one gallon sometimes. Uh, friends will always take free booze, but sometimes when you have too much, they're like, "Hold on, I got to finish. I got to clear out what I have." So unless you've got a couple friends who are just <laughs> rearing to go, you you, uh, yeah. you wind up with a lot of bottles set around. And I find that you know, just the other other end of that is just you know barrels. Barrels are pretty nice. Mm-hmm. Kegs are nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, Polish meads are nice because, you know, typically if you're making Dvunyak or, or anything in that realm, you're, you're able to make a, a certain amount of that. And, and then you're uh, aging and waiting a couple of years. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you're not necessarily, you know, needing to, to haul things away so soon. You're, you're waiting for it to actually arrive. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> I've yet to make a Polish mead, but I, I definitely, I definitely want to put that on my list. It's my problem is space of, of holding something like that. Like you're saying for that long, you kind of, for me, I have to cycle things out so that I can start new projects, especially doing YouTube, but mm-hmm. uh, I can't complain. I, it's a lot of fun. So, um, awesome. so we, we, uh, got to swap some meads. And so I want to go ahead if, um, and open up yours and if you'd okay. like to open up mine. So sure. I want to know a little backstory about this. Cause I was just, the name of it is, is, uh, unique enough. The, 
is it Margaret? Margaret mustard. Well, that's just mustard. it's a uh, it's a Marquette, uh, Marquette. It's a payment made with Marquette grapes. Okay. Uh, so how much I know about wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I'll, I'll give you a long story short. Uh, my uh, well, maybe a long story long, depending on how much time you have. We, uh, <laughs> oh, we got lots of time. <laughs> our our uh, back in 2020. Um, mm -hmm. We uh, had our, our uh, homebrew, uh, homebrew club uh, president, Nick Ashburn, uh, and I uh, went down to Jordan, Minnesota. It's about you know, 58 minutes, an hour, or something like that from, from St. Paul here mm -hmm. um, to a winery, uh, vineyard actually of the winery as uh, Moose uh, Sparkling Wine Company. Mm -hmm. And we went down there to go get some grape pomace, meaning the uh, grapes and stems after they had crushed that out and you taken the liquid away. Mm -hmm. And we had gotten that precisely because of an inspiration from Lost Cause Meadery. They did a, a mead called the Salvage Series, and they were putting uh, all of these, I guess, Grenache grape pomace on this, uh, this, this uh, honey uh, and, and a, a traditional, basically a mead that has been made and setting it on there with uh, Billy had said that it was about four weeks. I think he had to go on vacation for a little bit. So it was a little longer than that. Yeah. And then uh, supposedly with that, it really improved the mouth feel of this mead. And so we were kind of curious to, to explore that as a, in a homebrew fashion and go down to a, a actual working winery uh, that was going to be giving us some of this pomace. We brought back buckets of this Frontenac Gris um, uh, uh, pomace, which um, is grown there. And um, it's one of those cold hardy grapes. And while we were waiting, they had some problems with their machines. They were really nice and gracious to us. We went and sampled their, uh, their champagne method uh, uh, wines that they, they were working on, uh, some ciders and everything else. And when we got back from the main downtown Jordan location, we came back. Uh, they were still working on the machine. They finally got some things done, gave us our promise. And they said, we're really happy that you, you joined us today. And, um, you know, this was uh, right at the beginning of some of the things with COVID and, and whatnot. And so we were all, you know, there was not a, a huge crowd there for this. So, uh, but they were doing their picking and everything at the time too. They gave us um, a big old bucket of Marquette grapes. And Marquette grapes are, is like a, a kind of a hybrid variety that started at the U of M, uh, kind of in that Pinot Noir daughter family of, mm -hmm. of grapes, uh, has like a blackberry cherry flavored aromas, and it's cold hardy. And it's grown here as well as uh, Michigan, uh, Vermont, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, um, Maine. And, you know, it's just, it's one of those things that is its own, unique variety. And I said, wow, what am I going to do with this? I'm, I'm going to come back. And uh, I had really good Marquette uh, wines uh, from other areas here. And I decided that I was going to maybe try my hand at making a dessert wine, uh, something that was highly sweet, highly alcoholic uh, to a degree. Um, <laughs> and uh, with uh, a, a very unique honey, uh, mustard blossom honey. Now, uh, mustard blossom honey it came from a special buy through that AMMA. I had a 60 pound, you know, bucket of that. Ooh, so I had plenty of that to use. I didn't use all of that in this kind of <laughs> uh, But we had essentially an up, up, up gravity on this thing of being, you know, well above the 1180 some odd level here. I would have to uh -huh. look back at my notes, but you know, um, what I wanted to do was make something more along the lines of the dessert quality on that end. Mustard blossom honey is just one of those things where generally speaking, you've got like this butterscotchy, uh, caramelized meats, mustards, you know, mustard dust. And it's all kind of, you know, it's, um, it is an Indian, they call it India honey. It's produced uh -huh. outside of the country and um, it has a unique flavor compound of its own. And I was just interested to see how I was going to transfer in, in or transform, as it were, in in the fermentation yeah. process. So that's in a nutshell, right there. Um, it, it's that. fantastic. It's so, I mean, it's it, it like I said, it is sweet, it's desserty, but the it does have that. It's got a little, yeah, got a little uh, <laughs> carbonation. Um, it's got some, um, which I'm curious. Did was this kegged to carbonate with it being so sweet? Like, how did that's, you? Yes, I did force carbonate that. 
um, the intention was to make something that there's carbonic acid uh, mm-hmm. to a degree that kind of imparts a little better on that end because of the fact that we're, you know, making something so sweet. Um, and I guess the legs on it, I kind of wanted to kind of tool around with something that I normally wouldn't have made in ultra hopefully non cloying, uh, cloyingly sweet, uh, mead. It's, it's absolutely trying to find a, a working balance with all those mm-hmm. components. It's fantastic. Um, I, I think you've, uh, I really like, yeah, I still sent, also sent you a pie mint. I'm starting to try and yes. um, experiment, experiment myself with some, and I've only done, I think this might be my second pie mint I've ever done. Um, but the, that combination is just, I mean, honey and grapes, whatever varietal you're using is so nice. And I think that naturally they do kind of pair well together. What I like about this, I like that it's, it is super well balanced. Like it's sweet, but like you said, the, the acid balance and probably some carbonic acid itself has made it to where it doesn't feel like you're, I mean, you're not like eating a spoonful of honey. Like it's sweet, but th- there is that. And the tannic value, that's one thing I noticed. Um, we got to try, uh, I have a friend, uh, another YouTuber who brought the, the Kintram Heart of Darkness to try like six months ago. So we got, and obviously that's it, infamous. Everybody's like, I gotta try this. And so we got to try it. And the balance that he achieves through those things, sweetness, tannic, acidity, is is super nice and i get a lot of that here like you do you've done a great job balancing it thank you wow so that one right there (laughs) is uh it's i um not too it's a little young it needs some time i put back a bunch of bottles so apologize it's probably got a little heat to it but Mm -hmm. that one is my my second pie i've ever made it was a cabernet sauvignon um wine base because i i've yet to uh there's no wineries in Oklahoma for me to go and chat with um, We don't really, we're not known for that. So I had to buy a wine base and then I made for a video, I made just a straight up wine and then this pie mint and used blueberry honey. Um, kind of did the same thing as you kind of capped out the yeast and tried to push them to where you didn't have to back sweeten and uh, aged on, I can't remember kinds of oaks that came with it, but uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's my first no, or second try. Yeast that you used with this? I know it is relatively young, but I, I gotta say it's it's very very bright. It's punchy. I, so uh, I remember the kit came with. Um, someone asked me the other day on a YouTube comment why I used. I gotta look it up. I got my. I'm sure just like you, you have a whole booklet of things you've done, and because you start so many things. Um, they asked me why I used the. Oh no, where is it? Uh, it was a Red Star Cote de Blanc. I don't know how to say that right. Mm-hmm. Um, which I don't remember all the specs on it, but the the kit came with an EC one 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 eight packet, and I was kind of like, it just seems very brutal to uh, put your yeast through that. You mean I, I, to use a killer yeast, as mm-hmm. it were? I, think I mean the one that's I don't know, talked about as much, but yeah, I just, just so that's that's uh it, the coats blocks maybe maybe something that wasn't used for red, right? Traditionally, uh-huh. congratulations! <laughs> I used uh, QA twenty three on this wine, uh-huh. not really intended for red wines. Uh, I used that in tandem with uh, WLP English ale yeast. Mm. And uh, it's a curious thing using a couple of different yeasts with the creation of a mead and also making sure that you're not going to kill one or the other off. In the, let's in the let's dive into that because I, I obviously you have experience with it. And I don't I think that's something I haven't done a lot. You know, I, I have a I'm not going to say joking one, but so I do these yeast shootout things. And over in this corner, I have this yeast shootout that I, I do where I take a, a single rep- recipe and two different yeasts, whatever, you know, which one does better? Well, I, this last time I was like, what if I just stir up all of the leaves from both of them and just pitch them together and just let in, you know, put some more honey on top, see what happens. Uh, let's talk about like killer factor strain versus that stuff. When you're making something like this that has two yeasts, are you pitching at the same time? 
or are you staggering by a day or two to give like one a head start, so to speak, or how did you appropriately do that? Well, I knew that, you know, and I think this goes back that I was trying to maybe emulate some of the the experiments that maybe Lost Cause was using with ale yeast as, a, as opposed to traditional wine yeast. And the reason why I say congratulations is it's like, you know, with everything here, just because, you know, we have a variety of, of different wine yeasts that are out there that say, you know, you really should be using this for white, you really should be using this for red. It doesn't mean it's an all-encompassing factor for mead and not necessarily an all-encompassing factor for piment making either. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the benefit of, of using something uh, like an ale yeast is that we traditionally would get more of a, a clean ferment. And, you know, then there were with QA23, the reason why I was thinking about that is more for the tropical fruit punch uh, that will, would come through that. Carbon Wilson had talked a long time ago about using that with uh, creation of a, a mead with, with black currants and pushing the temperature on that to promote these wonderful esters. I did an experiment based off of that and it turned out wonderfully. So I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm looking at that, but I did look and I, and I do have, you know, traditionally we'll look up on Lalaman's site. They'll, they'll have a use reference chart online, go through what's, what's uh, a, um, killer yeast uh, strains or what, what are basically active or which ones were sensitive. And knowing that QA23 was a neutral uh, uh, yeast in that regard meant that I didn't have to worry about it competing or succumbing to the toxins of any other yeast being producing these, uh, basically these, uh, I guess, maybe proteins that are designed to hit upon certain receptor cells in, in, the, in the yeast and cause them to die. Um, and so by that nature, I was going to get the best of both worlds with this yeast. So I did kind of pitch the, uh, the dry yeast first, and then within the scope of the three days to four days after that did go with a hydrated, you know, well, go firm, et cetera, uh, QA 23 batch. So, uh, I think they worked in tandem together pretty nicely in that regard. Um, it's always an experiment to see what, mm -hmm. what happens, but, you know, I know you worked on something with, uh, some acidic based, uh, yeast and, you know, some of them, if you started out, um, I always heard about stuck fermentations and always heard about on uh, some of these forums, everyone using EC118 uh, to restart a stuck, stuck fermentation or whatnot. And, uh, you know, that's a killer yeast and that would basically kill off whatever's used there before. If you started with 71B and you had D47, D47 is going to kill off basically or you know, render uh, for 71B. So um, Lalaman's been really good about putting that data out there. Mm -hmm. um, you can look up charts online and it's, it's a really nice thing uh, to really understand. But you've got killer varieties of yeast that basically produce these toxins. you got these um, active uh, toxins and, and they, they, they basically don't possess the receptor cells for that yeast, but they do produce the toxins. You've got sensitive ones that are sensitive and do have the ability to have those things, mm -hmm. the, the toxins bind to them and cause them to die off. And then we have the neutral ones that neither create the toxins nor are affected by receptor cells. So it's not too sciencey, but you know, again, yeah. just kind of understanding maybe where that might uh, lend you to consider trying the best of both worlds or producing a blend perhaps of two yeah. different, uh, two different needs. Well, I think it is so important for people to, to, it, it, that is that concept itself for a, a beginning brewer, you know, which I find a lot of my audience, my, my big time videos that have, have gone out there are new brewer videos. So that's something that at the beginning, they're just trying to get a yeast and get going. But once you really dive down the rabbit hole, like we talked about earlier, and you, you ask yourself, how do I, you know, I, I made this, uh, whatever, blueberry mead. How can I make this better? And you look at your yeast and you go, well, I used um, whatever, D47. And then you see somewhere online, oh, someone said 71B works better for dark fruits. And so, so then Pete, you go and pitch some 71B in and you see what happens there. It's like this, this uh, just progression of understanding what yeast do. And to be honest, I not to say I wasn't a believer in that what yeast do, but I... 
until I did this big eight different yeast test where I did one batch of must pitched eight different yeasts in, into each one, each little, uh, container and let it go and then taste tested them. I, I didn't understand what really changed between each thing. Um, so e even at that point, after doing that test, there's still the next level to go. What happens when I combine yeast? And obviously mm -hmm. this, the flavor profiles from both have contributed really nice characters. And I think this thing is super good. Have you, have experience. you submitted, yeah. is this a, is this something you've submitted to any, any uh, competitions or is this just a recent brew? No, I mean, I'm glad you asked that. It's not something, it's something that made for, for me. Um, but it's also something where I wanted to give my kids the experience of stomping the grapes in the backyard mm -hmm. when we couldn't go to the wineries and other things and have those kinds of activities. Um, I actually handpicked all these things and put them into bins and it was a nice, nice fun afternoon. Um, but no, it's, it's one of the things I feel comfortable with. It's not something that I'm submitting for competitions. So it's not, you know, want to clear the air on that for sure. But, uh, it's, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's something nice for me. I, you know, might, might consider uh, other future experiments down the line for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's, it's like, like anything else. Um, yeah. Like trying, trying things out, seeing what works. Uh, there's so many different uses out there and they all contribute their own <laughs> unique, uh, varietal and uh, color en enhancements of, of varietal character and other things in, in wine. They do the same thing with um, certain kinds of honey. Um, and I think I just, you know, try to see what, what, what pairings might, might happen as best. And I'm sure you'll find, a, you know, uh, combining different kinds of honey together too is also another thing um i know it's 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 important to know we've had such an expansion of new opportunities for buying new and different uh varieties of honey that it's just uh, becoming again that kid in a candy store mentality of you know i got stuff coming from hawaii i've got this coming here you know i've got my uh, buckwheat from you know Europe, other areas, acacia, whatever. It's, you know, there's so many things out there, but not forgetting some of the wonderful honeys within your local backyard, the local beekeepers, those that um, really do give you maybe that sense of terroir where you are. Um, and I know I like, you know, not far away in Oklahoma and Texas, uh, the Yopan honey, the Yopan holly honey, um, you know, similar to like the family of Christmas berry, uh, the, the darker coffee, uh, flavoring and, and kind of that smoky nutty uh, flavor too, but it more more of an earthy coffee uh, flavor. It's one of the, the honeys that has, uh, well, I guess the highest caffeine uh, in the leaves and they actually use it to make, it's the, the one plant that has the highest caffeine in North America. Um, and then people make it, make teas out of it and everything. The berries are maybe good for cardinals and whatnot, not so good for humans. Um, <laughs> So it's like, uh, what is it, uh, Lex Vomitoria, the, uh, uh, the Latin for basically meaning that you can vomit from that, but it's, it makes a really nice honey. Central Texas, uh, give it up for uh, Walker uh, and they, Texas honey, they, they do the best. Um, but, you know, Christmas berry has its own thing. Yopon holly is its own thing. Uh, they've even got that California Toyon honey. It's its own thing. It's well native to California, which is a, a darker um, cousin. It's got more of that nutty. I'd almost think of that as being more malty. If you're interested in beers, you know, might be a honey for you. So um, I think where we're on topic of that is just basically, you know, we're, we're all trying to these out and seeing what what fits and what what you like and maybe you know what you might want to do something else with um and combinations thereof so and you yeah, yeah so earlier you mentioned um fireweed honey which is it it's very uh on point for for this week for me at least because i'm oh. one of my videos coming out is a fireweed traditional mead and it's coming out on thursday so in just a few days um so it's it's that's funny to me that you mentioned that because it is a a really interesting and fun honey to use and i um uh, my kind of resolve with it when i made it was i i didn't add enough uh like the honey itself the sweetness the character everything was really interesting but i didn't do much to to add to the tannic value and so it was just kind of i mean weak in that regard but to your point 
the different kinds of honeys you can get are, I mean, it's, it's insane. I've, I've kind of made it my point to now get as many honeys as I can, like I said, kid in a candy store situation. And, um, I, I try to, at this point, because one, because with YouTube content, if I just keep making the same traditional mead video, like it's okay, that's fine. You know, people have seen what a traditional mead is. I try to do some recipes now. So, um, like I just got some Christmas berry. It's funny you mentioned that as well. So I'm planning on doing a traditional <laughs> and then I don't really know what, what fruit or other flavors to pair with it yet. And then I'd like to make a boche. I have enough to do all three and just kind of see what I can get from it. So utilizing those resources, um, you also mentioned the uh, um, AMMA, uh, when you, so it's on their newsletter or yeah. it's on their website. It's like wh whenever yeah. you are a member of the American Weed Maker Association, you get access to exclusive deals on honey. And um, it's, it's through their own little avenue. Uh, I almost- It's really hard to say no. <laughs> yeah exactly it's it, do it's i need any more honey <laughs> yeah i don't know it's, it's hard I to say do something with it it won't go bad right you just gotta you just you know you can hold on no. to it for 10 years and it'll it's, still be good perfect perfect is the day it was put in the bucket <laughs> so if, if anybody's listening and wants to get honey of course i might i think as nathan said go to your local people because those people need our help the most um, same thing for homebrew shops. Uh, it's, it is easy to get on Amazon or to a online website and have it shipped to your house. And I'm guilty of that too. But go to your local homebrew store if you have one and support them because, I mean, they we're the only ones going to their stores. Um, and, and if you're not, you can still buy local honey online too. <laughs> I find yes. that that's also maybe an unfortunate convenience too. Uh, that, you know, if you're really want to try something i mean uh we've used a garden bees here bolton bees um man even just in the, in the state of minnesota we've got some pretty awesome stuff here um we certainly don't take for granted um in the slightest uh, the value is, is there for sure um some mm -hmm. uniqueness but yeah i i think that's that's just it trying to, to figure out you know what's what's the least and greatest flavor profile and, and seeing what works I want to uh, um, I want to ask you about recipe development because you've, you've got me interested. So you clearly have a uh, everyone has an idea in their head on recipes. How do you how do you plan your pairings, whether it be fruits or honeys and spices? Do you are you the type that likes to you know, go off a dish, you know, you, you find some sort of savory dish and you're like, oh, I want to try and make something that pairs well with it. What's your process? I think that's mainly the same lines as uh, some some foods that I've, I've enjoyed in the past. When it comes down to spice, the use of spice, um, like amateur spice, used in a lot of Indonesian cooking, um, it's made from, you know, mango skins and it tastes like lime. You know, hey, there's something that can really brighten up a dish um, and it can also brighten up a meat pretty nicely. So combinations of fruit, I kind of think about how those might pair well with one another. Um, and I will use it uh, even just to, to challenge myself in a non-traditional way. Um, uh, pandan leaf is another example there. Uh, you know, they use it in high cooking. It's you know, wrapping chicken. It gives that vanilla flavoring to a hmm, interesting uh, to a chicken uh, dish but i i don't use it to wrap chicken i <laughs> use it use it to make mead um and i found that that actually worked pretty well uh with one of my early experiments with with fireweed too so um yeah it's 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 complementary um i think it you know really just building on the base obviously in many respects um it's where you enter those spices you do this in post fermentation or what some people is called secondary fermentation and whatnot um you know how you how you want to do it i start with just kind of understanding maybe what my ratios are going to be um am i going to be making a, a hydromel am i looking to make a standard mead um or in some cases like that like the dessert or sack strength meads like you know um that's kind of where i i start and then i also look like what's what's available to me 
you know, what kind of honeys do I have and what have I not worked with? What do I, what do I want to work with? What can I, I don't know. Uh, you know, and, and so on and so forth. I'm, I'm all over the map really with that in that respect. Um, and that may be, you know, just my unfortunate uh, OCD aspect myself, just I'm, I'm trying to find something new and different. I also look at, um, I guess it's just, you know, the building blocks, uh, you know, how much, how much time, uh, how much nutrient I'm using, what, what will be the, the, the standard issue, uh, if you're bagging fruit, or in many cases, sometimes, you know, you're, you're juicing, if you're doing juicing uh, some of the berry fruits or whatnot, um, you know, I started out not doing much of that. I don't have a juicer at home, so I don't actually juice my own uh, fruit juices, as it were. Uh-huh. Uh, so it's something that maybe is an aspirational thing for me to, to get into that at some point in time. But, you know, kind of figuring out what the, the volumes are going to be and then just working it in my head a little bit, a little bit on paper. Um, I, I kind of use a lot of <laughs> yeah. post notes and try to do things here and there and uh, really just, you know, uh, work it through and, and see where it winds up. I will pay particular attention to uh, the nutrient schedule. Um, big fan of, of Tazna and, you know, using organic uh, nutrients where it can. Stayed away from, you know, some DAP and whatnot, not knocking DAP or, you know, any of the other uh, additives that are out there for, for nutritional value for yeast. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I've just kind of explored with making sure that I'm, you know, if, if I do need to use tannins, I'm using and trying to use it more so the, at the end of the fermentation period, uh, maybe even on a clarifying end because it's somewhat mm-hmm. helpful and beneficial there. Um, and then, uh, for acids, um, you know, just really, I, I kind of tend to avoid the citric acid cause I know it kind of metabolizes to a, a citil, uh, acidic acid that is more of that vinegar, uh, aspect or micro micro organism factors that, that kind of don't play too nicely. Um, but I think, you know, really at the beginning, it's, it's getting the nutrients down. Um, it's going to say something, I think mainly about the just the, the fact that you you can't over prepare and um really for the most part you know making sure that you know if you're clarifying and whatnot try to use different if you're using different products or whatnot that you try them out mm-hmm. see what works best i did use like sparkloid and other things it gave me a lot of weird fluffy stuff towards the end and I don't know, use, using filters and other things yeah. like that. Um, but I found one cool thing that I've just been using for a while that's worked best for me has been uh, adding uh, zinc to my meats. Interesting. Um, and, you know, I say this is kind of a caveat, you know, is that it's not complete science on my part, mm-hmm. uh, but maybe borrowed science on a brewer's part. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Joe Kinney who was at FX uh, Matt Brewing Company in New York. Did a paperback, like same time around 2017 or, or so, um, on using zinc in uh, brewing process for making beer. And it was um, zinc and fermentation, fostering healthy yeast. Uh, and they were finding that, you know, in the first couple of hours in the work, Easter are, you know, budding out there. They're doing all of these splits and they're making, you know, mother and daughter cells, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in that process, you know, they need a lot of nutrients. And one of those nutrients that's really uh, most common and needed is, is zinc. And barley really just doesn't have it as much. Uh, certain kinds of barley do and some don't have as much of it. And so they found that by using um the yeast with uh, adding nitrogen or not nitrogen, but uh, the zinc, what's it called? Zinc sulfate hydro, heptahydrate is what they were using. Uh, look that up. Um, and, uh, and they were adding this in and, uh, you know, in so many parts per million. And what it's finding is that they were having a faster fermentation, a cleaner fermentation, healthy esters, healthy yeast production. And in a brewery, they were, you know, washing yeast and, you know, in subsequent generations of this was actually uh, working out to their, their betterment overall, a consistent product, right? 
mm-hmm. um, which in the brewing industry, the brewing business, yeah, consistency matters more so right. than maybe your home brewing does. So I started looking into that um, as more or less the same time period where people were dealing with uh, their issues of stuck fermentations. And, you know, well, you got to add another yeast now in order to get out of that, or you've got to do some other things here. And it's like, wow, you know, uh, if zinc is required there, why not so in, in need? Um, you know, and uh, kind of having my own little insurance policy, as it were, on a, a positive outcome on my mead making. Um, and I said, well, you know, I don't want to get this uh, zinc heptahydrate because I mm-hmm. saw it hurt some bad things about how it's irritating the skin and all this other stuff. And I said, wow, you know, what's out there? And I looked up zinc uh, picolinate, which uh, studies of finding it's, it's a, an acid that's, you know, it's readily available, you know, uh, for absorption into the body. And it actually helps most people absorb zinc better in the body. And if, I figured if it wasn't really, you know, uh, so bad for pregnant women to take, probably couldn't be so bad for me to use in my need. Um, and with that, you know, I noticed that, you know, some other things that they were, were researching online, just kind of the amount of zinc that's actually in honey is usually about, for a gallon, maybe about 4.5 milligrams. Um, don't completely quote me on that, but, uh, you know, uh, if you're, if you're talking in terms of what, what's readily available there versus maybe what yeast might need, um, I know that the, the yeast manufacturers will say that their, their yeast have all of the nutrients and everything you need. And yeah, you probably don't need this at all to make a bead. You don't, obviously it stands to reason you don't because people have been making bead for a long time and they've never needed to do this. But I figured, um, getting some zinc picolinate, um, you know, would, would help maybe supposedly steady things and, uh, you know, add a little bit more, uh, to get those yeast, uh, really going more so than just doing go firm and some of the other hydration, you know, techniques and everything else that we use still using that. Um, but just making sure I had that on hand, maybe 50 milligrams is like a 40, what is it? 40 milligrams. Uh, is more than a recommended daily allowance of zinc. But when you transpose that or 50 milligrams across a five gallon batch, 10 milligrams per batch, it's like winning a little capsule. And you, you can do that if you had a high gravity need, which the beer company was finding that, you know, high gravity beers need more zinc. Um, you use more zinc and uh, see if it works and you're not overloading it. So it's just, just small experiments on that. Um, haven't done completely, I guess, ultra scientific side-by-side comparisons on that regard, but um, haven't had a stuck fermentation either. So, uh, you know, fingers crossed, it, it's another thing that maybe adds to the, the overall effectiveness of the outcome. If you're spending that kind of money on honey, pays to maybe research trying to do those things the right way. Um, in mm-hmm. addition to some of those other additives that are out there, the Opti Reds, the Opti Whites, um, I do subscribe to modern mead making uh, techniques for sure. And uh, I guess it's just nature of trying to, um, you know, make make less work overall and for the betterment of the yeast. Even if I'm not washing it and keeping it for another batch, uh, which I, I really don't because I'm just scared that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end up throwing some microorganism in the mix that I really mm-hmm. don't want to, to waste uh, time and energy on. No, I, so yeah, that's, that's a long explanation. For that's <laughs> really, no, it's super interesting. I, I had never um, really considered zinc in that regard. Um, uh, that is, that's something that I now want to, want to try, you know, I want to, I want to see that. And you're, you're totally right. Every single thing, whether it be zinc or for people who don't really use nutrients um, in general, or uh, let's say higher quality honey, like those, those things you put in, I guess the high quality honey is not appropriate here, but when you are spending money on the high quality honey, why would you not invest a little bit more into making sure those yeast are healthy? And, um, I, I see that a lot, especially with YouTube stuff. I get people who, I get people who say, I have a stuck fermentation all the time, you know, this, 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 they have issues. And, um, and most of the time those things root back to 
to yeast nutrient, yeast process? Um, did they, you know, use a Tosna schedule, stuff like that? It is a little bit overwhelming. And I'm sure you recall when you first started uh, making mead, it, it sounds like you had a, a little bit of the process underneath your belt already. So, yeah, it, it was it was starting. I mean, I, you get inspiration from the folks around you. Um, huh. Very lucky, and I can't say that enough. I was just uh, maybe a foot soldier, as it were, in the, in the process of greatness of other mead makers here. Um, huh. But yeah, you, you just, I mean, it's, it is like to degree trial and error, um, making sure that you're not, you know, overly oxygenating something unless you know you're you're really truly wanting to get something that tastes like sherry um you know i don't don't really like a wet cardboard mead um so you know yeah it's it depends on what it is and if it has a place um in your technique i was i just feel like yeah i i was always trying to find another way to maybe do do better overall i was uh, thinking about headspace because i had all of these six gallon uh Car glass carboys, right? Um, where in brewing, you know, I had like a, you would have typically a six gallon and then you transfer it down to a five gallon carboy to eliminate that headspace. Well, I never had any of those five gallon carboys. I always had excess headspace in most of these, these beers I was making. I was taking a, I, I took a little uh, cryo uh, tube uh, component. I joined a bunch of pieces together. I got I got a cryo tube off of the, the internet. On bought, bought that. Got a couple of different things and parts from my local hardware store, and then a gas uh, coupler for uh, just putting my my CO2 tank on and connecting this thing together with a little tube on it, filling up the headspace with CO2, and that kind of you know got rid of my oxygen problem. Um, later on, I just said, well, with mead. Uh, I really want to use all this CO2. So I was using just the plain old uh, wine uh, preserver spray that is just great. Um, wonderful argon gas, uh, CO2 nitrogen mix. And, you know, a little blanket goes a long way. And uh, buy that stuff. Uh, you'll save money if you buy it by the case. But, you know, uh, <laughs> it's, it's just it's just another another little thing never being afraid to think about well um there is an answer for something the, the, the internet isn't totally evil it does have some answers out there um some people have used these these methods and you know it's it's not new and different as much as it is has it worked and can yeah. it work for you so. it's the extra steps i think that's what scares a lot of people and i'm sure people listening now are it is a scary thing to have to honestly invest more time and effort. And especially when uh, I feel like most of mead is, is um, toted to be this like ancient alcohol that like th if the Vikings did it and they made it great stuff, then like you should be able to, too. And so then with that, there comes this like mentality that, well, if the Vikings did it, surely there wasn't that much process. You just throw it all together, let it go, you know, and it, it's magically good. And obviously, we, we have no idea what their meat tasted like. I think everybody can speculate it was good and or it was good enough for them to, you know, get their fill. But we now have modern meat practices. And uh, it is a scary thing for new brewers. I remember myself. I, I purposefully did not make beer because I did not want to buy all the equipment that came with beer making. I was like, man, I got to go buy. Uh, if I really want to do this right, I got to have something to actually heat a pot evenly. And I got to buy a big old pot and I got to buy this and this. And then, oh, now I got to get, you know, just so much stuff. So I didn't, I didn't do it. I didn't make beer. I made a couple batches with my brother, but then found mead. And I fell on the exact same trap as I'm sure everyone else. I heard honey, water, yeast, shake it up, let it go. And it starts as that, but to be a better mean maker, you have to do more. And I think mm -hmm. that's what's important is there's, there's no uh, uh, lackadaisical mead making. Mm -hmm. Maybe in Actually some instances. Yeah. So that's, that's tough uh, for some people, but obviously you've got your process down. And once you have your process down, it becomes more fun because then you get to, to, experiment more comfortably because you understand things and, and 
how to uh, change things appropriately. And, and also boredom, boredom has a lot to do with it, uh, <laughs> to be brutally honest. Because when you talk about having all this equipment, well, when I first started making beer many moons ago, I'm going to sound ancient here, but we didn't really have all these homebrew shops. We had like, uh, oh, you'd get this kit and, you know, a friend of mine is a mechanical engineer back at Virginia Tech, played in a band. I was a keyboard player. I didn't know how to play guitar. I wanted to play guitar so because I could then be in band. Uh, because <laughs> the only things I could do, they play some Doris tunes or whatnot. So through boredom, I learned to do that. Uh, we made stouts. That was it. There was really not a lot of stuff available to us. And come, come about uh, later on, buying some of this equipment um, out of boredom, you know, just making beer styles, you know, classic styles are great. But, you know, man, I was bored. I wanted to add fruit. I want to make fruit beers. I wanted to make vegetable beers. I actually made a really wonderful beet lager as one of my challenges, uh, submitting these things. I started getting into those contests like, like we were talking about before, but it's mainly out of your boredom to try to find the next thing. Mead enables you to try all of these different things, um, and there's no lack of boredom. So, you know, if you're bored from making beer, if you are a brewer, you know, obviously there's – there's a lot of great things you can do with beer and it's not that beer is boring at all the slightest. Uh, but you know, it, it enables you to have appreciation for the fact that there's so many other things available um, in flavor combinations and uh, even getting back into like braggots or other things. These are, these are great things to, to just continue to explore. Wonderful thing. So that you, 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 Circle me back to a question I had for you earlier. Um, sorry, it was, my brain w goes through little pockets. And so you, you talked about I'm primary too. versus secondary or post-fermentation stages. Um, obviously, it's all semantics at this point. You know, some people prefer in whatever way they want. When you're introducing spices, do you find yourself, let's say, cinnamon or really any baking spices, stuff like that? Are you going to introduce those things in that primary state or do you prefer to add them in the quote? secondary, whatever, post-fermentation stage, or is it de recipe dependent? I, I typically do introduce in that secondary post-fermentation stage that that's kind of that, that ability to absorb some, some strong spices don't really need it, but, you know, things like, uh, let's even just say like vanilla, for instance, you know, yeast like to eat that stuff right at the very beginning. If you plunk it in, unless you're plunking in a significant amount, um, you're, you're going to eat it all up and not really get the benefit of it. Um, that's a harsh lesson for some folks who spend a lot of money on vanilla, vanilla beans. Um, and so I do like to add that in fruits and things like that. You know, you, you do a little bit of a nuance. I feel like there's a dance with uh, some fresh fruit and, and whatnot in the beginning and primary. And then also the nuance of adding in secondary too. There are so many schools of thought that say, oh, you've got to add it right up in front. If you're making a fruit bomb, yeah, you're going to be, you're going to be doing that. Or if you're doing the waterless uh, oh, yeah. combinations there of there, and you know, that's, that's going to be a, a big part of that's a combinations of s several pounds upon pounds of fruit. And, you know, other than, other than where, folks will, you know, do juicing and actually using that for the majority of their liquid, you know, centerpiece on the, on that. Um, I think it's all about really what, what you want your curtain call to be, you know, and I, I think I'm saying this probably because I watched Sing too with my kids the other night. I'm thinking about all these wonderful plays that we didn't, <laughs> that we had a chance to see around here, but you know, you see a touring company come through here, they'll, they'll have 24, nights you know with uh was it a matinees and, and evening performances in which to have a curtain call where they come out at the end and everybody's applauding and saying yeah yeah this is a great great play they take their bows um meads kind of like that you know you got your traditionals or you know your show meads these are you know some can be operas some can be musicals some can be shakespearean plays or whatnot uh but it's really you know at the end if, if it's a musical they're they're, they're doing their curtain call and they're also applauding the, uh, the orchestra, right? Because that's really uh -huh. where that comes from outside of a Shakespearean play to a degree with its directors and whatnot. 
going off the deep end with this, but just to say that uh, if you want your curtain call and your mead and your presentation of that, which if you're also entering into competitions and serving it up 24 different states or times, including family and friends, um, if you want to know what level of that spice is going to be the best for you, it is in secondary. And in certain times, uh, there are people that like to dose their needs and do a, a bench trial to determine what they want to add to that eventual need. Then you kind of have an estimation, not necessarily to find outcome for what your curtain call will be. Hopefully that makes a little sense. Yeah, no, that that's totally, um, and my little kind of school of thought is that um, you, uh, obviously you can't take things out of a brew. You can only exactly. put things in. And so I feel like I end up recommending for most people who end up brewing it all to put, especially anything that's, that's going to be a, a dominant flavor, uh, unless it's like a fruit, you know, I, I feel like I end up landing on lots of fruits in the primary and that's because of, like you said, skins or fruit flavor, that stuff. Sometimes yeast have their own reactions with sugars from fruit. And so then you, you want that kind of reaction, but anything that's going to be a predominant spice flavor, dominant thing, um, oak, even you want to put later on, um, <laughs> So you can control because I've had, you know, I've had instance where I put a uh, habanero in something and, you know, Joe Schmo in Missouri put his habanero in for five days and it was the fine level for him. Mine was in for 24 hours and it was, it was already too hot. So being able to control and taste test in that secondary stage is like so powerful for a new brewer. It allows you to actually control what you're doing. I, I really do appreciate peppers and I have a friend of ours that um, used to make tons of different types of pepper beers. Um, you know, there's so many opportunities with the Bucciolokia peppers, et cetera. And um, I remember making one ungodly hot uh, uh, Piri Piri mead, which I love the spice and it's, it's maybe okay for me. You drink one of these, you feel like you've eaten a whole pizza and you're done. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, the level of, you know, the, 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 the stoic uh, uh, the saying goes, you know, if you've got a, a level of, of heat that's, that's on it and you know what the Scoville level is on that uh, pepper, you might think otherwise uh, <laughs> now you approach it uh, because, yeah, you I don't want, you don't want anyone breathing fire at the end of, of something when, you know, they're obviously not going to be tasting the honey uh, or <laughs> what you intended to put in there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a way to sometimes mess up what you, what your best intentions were uh, mm -hmm. if you go overdo it. So yeah, definitely. I, I appreciate that thought. And that's kind of where I was going to is it's that you don't want to, you don't really, you, you, even, even with back sweetening and sugar, you know, um, uh, some, some people will like to use honey. Um, some people will like to use different sugars and, and other things. Um, and, you know, maybe a more of a neutral honey to back sweet, maybe an alfalfa or something other than what you used to make this mead with to begin with might be a back sweetener option, but you're always going to deal with you know, hey, uh, have I put too much? What what really do I need to do in terms of, of this? If you get to a point where you might, you know, you know what it tastes like at a point and, and you've done this before, you may know how hey, I got to add a certain amount of honey to this um, to back sweeten, but other otherwise you're you're pretty well good on um, just noting that the the bench the bench trials are really gonna gonna help benefit. And I, I, I don't do that as much as I think I should. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's just a nuance and, and a learning curve for me to challenge myself to do more of that. Um, yeah, indeed, uh, you've got to, got to think about kind of what you want this to be at the end of the day. Yeah, and that's, that's really hard for new brewers to, to do whenever you're so new to it and you just, you're following a recipe, you're following, you know, someone like Myers, my own recipe, um, 
no understanding tweaking and things that becomes personal. So I guess my last little thing, cause I don't want to hold you forever. What would you um, say to, or what advice would you give to new brewers, to people who are just kind of getting their feet wet in this field? Is there something you wish you had known earlier on or mistakes to avoid anything like that? Uh, you know, I, I keep thinking about, you know, a great Val Kilmer film uh, <laughs> back in 1985, I think. Uh, always never forget to check your references. Uh, <laughs> always look uh, towards others to, to give, give a level of advice and see what others have done. Uh, really kind of, you know, putting some thought to that. I think if there's something that I really wish I had learned earlier on, I think better is the proper level of stabilization, you know, um, don't want to get to that, oh, unfortunate gusher of a bottle bomb. Um, if you, if you haven't stabilized and you're, you're finding that something you got has really unfortunately had some really odd changes, uh, <laughs> in its storage, uh, hot or cold, um, can, uh, can produce some awful results. I think the best thing to do is to reach out to a homebrew group, get involved. It, it may be harder to get together in some some areas than others and find mutual friends and uh, folks that have the same love or even better love of some other crafts like ciders and beers than you do. Uh, maybe, you know, put yourself outside of your comfort zone there and learn from those folks. Um, uh, and go to competitions. Um, I... I'll say this, that it'd be great to steward a competition if possible. I myself am not a beer judge. I am not a mead judge. I'm not a cider judge. I'm not certified. Um, I aim for that to be maybe an aspiration of something that I should do to make myself a better mead maker. Um, I just think that that's, that's the other thing that, you know, putting yourself into a position of being able to take more time I really should have talked to you about the aroma quality of the, the wine that you have this wonderful, this wonderful blend and um, the clarity of this, uh, the mouth feel. And then uh, overall, I mean, I know that this, this is, you know, like you said, it was young. It's going to get better. Give it some time. Uh, don't, uh, don't necessarily think you have to throw out any sort of mistakes you've made. I have typically, led with, we drank the mistakes we make. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't like them that much, you can certainly give them up as a, as a okay mead to someone else. But yeah, it's, you know, hopefully you don't, you don't give those to everyone. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have, I have not made a perfect mead all the time. So, you know, I do recognize if there's something that's happened, that's wrong. I need to back, backtrack on my process and see what happened. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a long and short of it. Um, make the mead you want to drink, join, join with others that are like-minded, um, maybe can, who are not like-minded, who will show you something new in the way of um, all of these wonderful types of meads that are available to us and all these wonderful categories of mead. Um, and learning something new uh, when you, when you go about it and be happy with it because it's, it's, it's a living thing, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it does produce something in way of experience that changes over time too. Mm -hmm. I think that's that point right there is the most exciting thing about mead making. It's that, you know, that, that brew right there tastes how it is right now at this moment in history. And if you're patient enough, something will change. Now, sometimes things change for the worse and sometimes they change for the better. And you don't really know until you, you set them back and you wait. Um, obviously it's not as easy for people who don't have the storage space. So that becomes a debacle for some people. Obviously some people listening now are like, well, I live in New York and I have a 20 square foot apartment. You know, I can't really store 25 bottles and that's, that's fair, but do what you can to put things back and let, let time heal things <laughs> over. I mean, I will say that I will say that, even with, you know, aspirations, small aspirations along the way, small goals, beneficial trends are a source of hope. You continue to work on something, 
And you know, yeah, um, you can look back on this and also taste it at a different time. And man, it's, it's amazing. Uh, it, uh, it, it does change. Um, and you can have something truly wonderful uh, from the moment of its inception and also truly wonderful later on. <laughs> yeah. Cheers to you. I appreciate hey. that. Yeah. I so Nathan, I thank you for your time. Dude, this has been a blast. You um I, I'm so glad that we got to sit down and chat. And uh j- just like the the meat house is done with you, I, I hope to return one day and chat with you again because I feel like I've only picked about five percent of your brain. And <laughs> as as someone who in my own <laughs> OCD <laughs> said <laughs> in my own little OCD way and, and um, desire for information. I want to, I want to see what else you got. And so I would love to get you back on here at some point. Um, is there any place that we can, like, is there anything you want to promote any, anything in your world that you got going on? I know you're involved in some competitions and whatnot. Oh, I mean, I know that, uh, yeah, some, as things are going right now, uh, yeah, there's so many things out there. Um, I've been very selective. I would also just say that, you know, locally in the Twin Cities area, at least, you know, we've got some, some things that are going on. Um, later on in the fall, I know that uh, Valkyrie's Horns to be hosted here um, and some wonderful mead makers that I've known for a number of years have been very instrumental at, at creating a, a wonderful mead competition in the Twin Cities. I do think that it's growing uh, by leaps and bounds. So, um, yeah, I'm very happy to, to be a part of that and maybe uh, have the opportunity to steward and something like that um, and, and learn a little bit more of the ropes. Um, I participated as a competitor in the past and uh, just feel like, you know, um, can't encourage people enough to just look and find uh, opportunities, even those that are listed on the AMMA uh, website um, and through social circles with Facebook, et cetera. Um, you know, it's, it's out there. Um, and, uh, you know, just continue to consider sharing away and, you know, ask around, uh, there's some, some posted boards of competitive, uh, brewing, uh, forums and, and posts and got mead, et cetera. And even, you know, uh, folks that you might know yourself, um, pass that information on, uh, it's, it's definitely a, a wonderful thing. I'm not a great self promoter. Uh, so I just like to say that I, I appreciate the people around me that allow me to participate in this great hobby and, um, hope to, hope to do, uh, Minnesota proud in some way or another. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where we just learn the great camaraderie that comes from joining in something that's, uh, a truly amazing hobby. I, I totally agree. And I, it's, it's funny you mentioned Valkyrie's Horn because that was one, I think I was about a week late from sending stuff in. I was like, had intention and then I got busy. So, but I, that's one that is, uh, I want to push. And then, like you said, any competition, any organization, try to be involved. Just get involved and you will learn more from your involvement in with other people than you will honestly by yourself. I think you can only do so much experimentation, but when you got 12 people, who are all doing experiments, you're going to learn a lot. So, yeah. And MH, MHEBA, the Minnesota Home Brewers Association, I uh, can't thank this, the group that I've been with enough to just be uh, honest, uh, giving great feedback, and also, you know, showing me uh, a thing or two about brewing and, and also mead making and cider making and wine making too. Mm-hmm. So Nathan, thank you for your time. Uh, I know I've kept you uh, longer than I said, and I apologize, but this has been a blast. I've I've loved this. Absolutely. Happy to do it again. And I appreciate everything you do and all your experimentation. That's, that's genuinely, man, that's the core of it right there. Experiment, experiment, experiment. Yeah. Well, there's no shortage of, of silly experimentation on silly or serious experimentation on my channel. Um, and I just hope I can keep entertaining and, and uh, hopefully educating in the process. So yeah. cheers thanks, to thanks you. For the, thanks for the pint, man. That's Dude, awesome. thank you for yours. This is, I, I still got half a bottle. I got to show my, I'm going to go uh, share some with my wife and have a nice. pepper chai. 
So well, that's the, that's the art of a dessert wine. It's meant to be shared. Huh? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hey, cheers to you. Thanks for uh, stopping by, <laughs> and um, we'll do this again hopefully in the future. Absolutely. Thanks, sir. Have a good Thanks, evening. Man. Cheers. Yeah, great one.